But let's go to toddler and preschoolers. Let's see what they bring to us today. Anybody in here have a toddler and a preschooler? Oh, and you're going to have a, you're going to have another one, right? That you're going to be busy, aren't you? Yeah. Um, they are so funny. I think about these kids uh, when you think about the experiences you have with them. Um, but let's take a little journey and think about it. toddlers are considered one to three years of age, preschoolers four or five up to entering school. We also know that when you focus, and, and did you notice how we're, what we're doing here? I hope everybody and our listeners are noticing. What I want you to do, especially if you are not used to taking care of children, when you have a toddler question or a preschool question or an infant question, you want to focus in on what is the main things that are going on with this child. So for preschoolers and toddlers, anthropometric enhancements, what does that mean? That means they're going to start doing what? Getting taller. They're getting more muscle mass. So anthropometric, so we're going to do, you know, our continue certain measurements. Cognitively, they're in that pre-operational phase. So you know what? Two to four, they're preconceptual. That's the one that they can only do one thing at a time. That's the basis of parenting classes. Have you, you've been in the grocery store, I know you have, and you've heard that mother say to the, her little toddler, Johnny, come over here and stop doing that and doing this, and, and he keeps saying it. Johnny can't keep up with all those instructions. Johnny needs one instruction at a time, right? And that's part of it. And so then you get into that four to seven year old period, which is still pre-operational. This is the intuitive. They're very much tuned into causation. If I do this, I might get in trouble. Okay, so that's starting of the morality and the development of conscience. Psychosocial toddlers are becoming autonomous and preschoolers are taking initiative. And so again, periodicity guidelines tell us all the good things we need to do, like subjective, objective data, uh, were scheduled. Now let's talk about our schedule. Toddlers should come for a visit, and this is ideal, 12 months, 15, 18, 24, 30, everybody highlight 30 for a minute, and 36 months. And the reason I say 30 highlight, when Bright Futures was acquired by the American Academy of Pediatrics, guess what? There used to not be a 30-month 30 vis 30 visit. But think about this. I already told you how important the first three years of life are. So if you went from 24 months to 36, it's a huge year of, you know, a lot could happen. So they stuck 30 months in there. That's kind of fairly new. One other thing I want to tell you while I'm speaking to this, one thing they did take out of all of the labs, remember how we used to do urinalyses at certain points in time? Guess what? They took it all out. We only do UAs as indicated. It's not just done just to do it. So, but, and the reason they did that is because we're doing UAs more often as indicated. You know what I'm saying with behavior changes. So that's, those are two kind of big important points. And um, the interview we know is important because guess what? That toddler is striving for autonomy. And this is also the time of tamper tantrums um, are common. I had one the other day in the office, just had a complete meltdown. You know, just, just we, the mother and I just kind of looked and just let them have them. We just stood there and watched, you know. But you know, that's typical. Major fears emerge. They think that they're going to lose. If you get a little shot, they think all their blood's going to be lost out through that. So you better put a Band-Aid on everything, okay? And um, child, let them touch the equipment, your stethoscope and so forth. You know, give choice. You want to sit on mom's lap or dad's lap? You can give a choice like that. I still remember a nursing student that I had that had a kid in the hospital. And um, she went in to say, I'm coming back in a few moments to give you your shot. Well, these were two little girls that had cystic fibrosis. They're vitamin K shot. They get it all the time. Guess what? And we were going through, um, the hospital was going through accreditation. The girls got a hold of each other, and they left the floor. They went and hid. We couldn't find them. They left the floor, the pediatric floor. How about that? So give the appropriate choice, is what I'm saying. So that was a lesson. To, that was also one of my nursing students that brought in, uh, she brought her purse to the floor with a gun in it, but, and, the, and the purse was stolen. That was a glorious week, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Losing two patients and having a gun. So anyways, um, I could write a book on experiences. 
Continue to progress from non-invasive to invasive. Well, if that child comes in because his ear hurts, he's complaining of his ear, you know you're not going to go to that. You're going to start with everything else you need and end up with the ear. And we think about our physical things so that we're going to keep in mind all the length and weight. Now, length, a lot of these little toddlers still stand like this. You know, they kind of stand back. So you've got to still get a good length before they can get a good standing height. BMI weight, head circumference up to the age of two. Um, serial measurements, dental development, vital signs. We start to do blood pressures around three years of age. And by the way, with blood pressures, you know what we do with blood pressures. You use a chart. You have to, you have to look at their, their height and age and compare where they fall with their blood pressure. So it's not just taking the blood pressure and going off. You've got to compare it to height and age. Um, physical exam, anterior fat now by 18 months, chest head equal by a year. Remember earlier I said the head looks like the largest part of the body, but oftentimes the chest is just a smidgen larger, but here they're about equal. Eye exam, TMs may be red, assessed for neck masses, and they're mouth breathers. Being a mouth breather, they breathe with their mouth. They sometimes will, you may hear snoring, or you may be consideration, uh, may have considerations of polyps, adenoids, and so forth. You want to think about things like their periorbital edema, uh, which may link into a concern maybe with a cardiac condition, nasal discharge, mouth throat exam, again, looking for fluoride, unusual tooth, I'm sorry, too much or too little fluoride, meaning that the teeth are not developing well, unusual tooth eruption, fissures at the lip corners, voice, cardiac. Now, we're going to be talking about here with the cardiac, they, you've had children that have had what's called TET spells, T-E-T -E spells, where they sleep in their knee chest position. That's to slow down the return of blood flow. And when we do cardiac, it'll come alive when I talk about cyanotic heart lesions. Heart sounds, be, um, they typically, the point of maximum impulse is located where? Fourth intercostal space, midclavicular line. And we are going to do, um, to have a discussion on innocent murmurs. Chest lung exam, abdomen, again, prominent abdomen, it shouldn't be flat. Liver edge may be palpable. We pretty much talked about all the GUGI. Nothing's different in, the, in this age child. And musculoskeletal, let's take a moment to talk about musculoskeletal. Um, what is genuverum? Well, let me do, let me do the other one. Ge let's do genuvalgum. Knock knees, knees stick. That's the way you think about it. And typically that's associated with preschoolers. Now, verum, the way I remember verum, and that usually goes with a toddler that has a what? Wide-based gait, because anybody that's drinking too much rum, verum, has to walk with a wide-based gait, right? So that's usually considered bow-leggedness. We call it wide-based gait. Turned in foot like femoral interversion or tibial torsion. Well, children that have that as they're getting taller are going to do what? They're going to maybe trip over their legs a little bit. You give them a little time, they'll outgrow that usually. Okay, they'll outgrow that. And um, lymph nodes, we already talked about 1CM inguinal and the supraclavicular nodes and developmental monitoring. Well, I'm not going to go back over the gross motor and fine motor that we talked about for the kid. Remember earlier, just so everybody understands, when we first introduced gross and fine motor, we went all the way to 24 months. And so I'm not going to go back over that. But let's pick up and um, let me see here. We're going to pick up and go back over from 24 months forward. So you can see there you can go back to growth and development. But at two up and down steps, kicking ball without falling, running with a gait. At three, they can hop and ride a tricycle. At four, up and down stairs with alternating feet, riding a bicycle with training wheels. At five, they can skip jump rope and play ball. And you'll see here for fine motor, beyond two years, they get a tower of eight cubes. My goodness, that's, that's pretty tough, I would imagine. Turn a doorknob. At three, they can copy a circle, build a tower. At four, Oh, have you seen children's art? Four to six parts. Let's talk about that. I just love to have a child tell, draw a picture of their daddy. Okay, now if daddy's very loving, this is what daddy's going to look like. Daddy usually has a very big head, right? <laughs> I have to think about their art. Because daddy's big and awesome. 
and he's got a long body because he's tall. Because that's what they see. They look up at it. Sometimes they have feet or maybe not too, because that's pretty non-specific because they're not really looking at the feet. If daddy's very loving, his arms will be long and encompassing. But kids that have been in foster care and don't have a loving father figure often have no arms. So you've seen, you know, you see what I'm saying? So f- children's art is very, very, very perspective of their environment, what they see, what they experience. And five, they can copy a square, copy uh, multiple shapes, print letters, and tie shoes. Does this resonate with all of you who do your well-child checks? Doesn't this, isn't this on the form you're using? Absolutely. And then we think about um, Piaget's pre-operational thinking. Again, the characteristics are centrician, egocentrism. Let's talk about that word. Now, a lot of people think, well, she's, she's egocentric. That doesn't sound like a very positive term. But egocentrism in children who are developing, especially this stage here, is very, n- being narcissistic. Egocentric is very important to developing what? A sense of who they are and continuing all that development. Um, we also, what is animism? That means giving this pig lifelike characteristics, okay? Um, hearing and vision, vision 20, 30 by five, five years, hearing, uh, you know that if they are developing their language, they probably are hearing fairly well. But oftentimes, play audiometry, that's that little board that you give the kids, you ask them when you're checking their hearing to point to a sailboat or a ball or whatever. And so that's part of the play audiometry. Pure tone audiometry, you need a little bit more cooperations usually after three. Language development by age two, there's your 50 word vocabulary, two step commands, talking constantly at uh, age three, 900 words. Boy, they've really expanded. And by four, it's to understand phrases and simple analogies. So those are all going to be kind of key in terms of their development. Five, the one that gets everybody, that gets everybody kind of like upset is those four colors. Most kids know at five many more colors than that. But again, we're talking about the average child and what that child has been exposed to and so forth. Um, They use sentences. Now the tip, there's that little tip, two words by two, three by three, four by four, and five by five meaningfully. They're constructing sentences. They're actually communicating with you. Now psychosocial. Um, we think about, you know, there, this is a time of becoming autonomous. Uh, discipline's important, trying to get aggression, impulse control. When they go to pre-K, what does their report card or their daily report say? It's about how they got along. How, who, who, did they, you know, who did they share with and things like that. Play. They love play on the test, pink pig, okay? Play is a major psychosocial medium. Toddlers have onlooker parallel play. Now, what does that mean? Let me give you an example. If all of y'all were toddlers, and I had a big chest of Barbie dolls and clothes and Kens and all that right here, and all of y'all had gotten a break, a doll with some clothes and so forth, I'm going to use you guys again. You, your doll, you picked up some shoes. She's looking at you, and she sees, oh, you got shoes. She's not going to talk to you about it. She's going to get up and come look for some shoes for her doll. So that's parallel onlooker play. It's not until they become preschoolers that they start to associate and cooperate and give each other roles, more dramatic and more physical play, right? Does that make sense to you? So they usually ask some questions on that. Y'all would do fine with those. Stage appropriate screening, there's your Bailey scales of infant development, again, that often does follow. And you'll see why it's important, especially those of you who are in practice, it's the gold standard for diagnosis of developmental delay in infants and toddlers up to about 42 months. Please know, Denver goes to six years, but this one is only reliable to 42 months. Um, it separates out mental, motor, and behavioral um, uh, types of issues. Does anybody know what the ASQ is, Ages and Stages Questionnaire? You probably have heard of that. That's one that is done over time in the home. Um, so don't get wor- I mean, I could give you many different ones, but they usually rely on, on these two, the Denver and the Bailey. Anticipatory guidance, off the bottle, drink from a cup, encourage utensils. Here is a pink pig, believe it or not. They want to know when you introduce the use of a spoon to a child, 15 to 17 months. You guys are uptown. You got another one there, okay? 
Avoid simple sugar, snacks, and drinks. Don't force eat. And often toddlers have food jags. I always tell students this one mother that I had, she was distraught when she came for the visit. She was so upset about what her child was eating. All he wanted was ketchup bread. And the way he wanted it, he wanted white bread with the crust taken off, and he wanted ketchup down the middle, and he would push it together and make like a picture, and that's all he wanted to eat for, like she said, for weeks. I think she was exaggerating. Kids will do that. They'll go through food jacks. And then guess what? Families should go along preparing the foods that they normally eat, put it on the table. He came around. Kids will come around, right? So there you go. A lot of your role is helping parents understand how to put this back into perspective. Now, dental health, there's your one by one. Again, the injury prevention, you guys go back to that same list that we gave you in growth and development. Sleep, the thing about sleep, rituals, consistency at bedtime should be, that should be for any child all the way through adolescence. Nightmares begin around age three. Night terrors typically occur between two and six months. Most outgrow as they get older. One of them, they typically wake up and have, which one is it that they, ha they don't have a recall of what the memory was about? Night terrors, right. And so, um, but just know that there, there could be, have some sleep uh, kinds of concerns. The um, toilet training, hugely popular activity for parents, right? <laughs> I have to laugh about this. Um, psych uh, physiological, psychological readiness between one and a half and two and a half years. Typically, you're going to get what? Average time, you're going to get daytime before nighttime. And they don't start in times of stress. Stress could be grandma moving into the house, okay? Bringing a new baby home. I remember when my daughter's uh, third child, when she brought her, uh, that, that my little second, the little second granddaughter was, she really regressed. She started TTing in her pants and things like that. Don't punish, reward all good efforts. Lots of different strategies available for parents to understand how to manage that. Now the red flags, if a one-year-old is not imitating sounds, pulling to a stand, indicating gestures by pointing, or if you have, look at this, at 18 months, no eye contact. But you know what? An 18 month is a year and a half. If you have a parent that tells you that their child doesn't look at them, they probably have been telling you that before then, and you probably picked that up before it. What are you thinking about? Autism, autism spectrum. So that's really going to be key. Don't feed with a spoon and don't squat spontaneously. Let me make sure you understand this one. We haven't done muscular dystrophy yet. We're going to talk about it in um, the muscle section. But think about this. Most toddlers play low to the ground, play. They jump up, run over here, and play with their little friends and so forth. It's the kid with muscular dystrophy where the muscles are poorly differentiated. They're replaced. They don't have, they have muscle pelvic girdle weakness, they can't keep up with their peers. So I don't mean from the perspective of a kid that's going to squat to, because of a cardiac condition. It's more for a muscular condition. Um, we also know in two years they don't walk upstairs or use two, three word sentences or nose cars, animals, extended self-stimulation behavior. Or at three, they're not aware of their environment, can't ride a tricycle, don't follow simple talk, still talk baby talk. Don't show an interest in imitating their parents at four, don't listen to a story or speak in sentences, head bang rock, not toilet trained at four, remember we said one and a half to two and a half years, don't draw a human figure, and at five, that magical thinking is still very dominant, no impulse control, because guess what, they're getting ready to go to school, so they should have a lot of these under control. So there's two topics we're going to talk about. One is stuttering, and the other one is PDD. These are kind of common, and so what we want to think of is stuttering, Pretty much it runs in families at some point, and it's, you know, it, 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 it's familiar. It can be familial. Um, whenever you have a child that stutters, make, remember stuttering is tied into all of your psychos, um, I'm sorry, your um, sensory motor abilities. So you want to make sure that they don't have a hearing or a visual impairment. And there's really no particular studies for it, but you have parents ignore the, you know, the initial presentation, um, tell them to be, parent, uh, to be patient, and you need to know when to refer. This is a child that stutters more than six months. They are over the age of six, and they avoid speaking altogether. That's a child that needs to be referred out to communication disorders. Like in my town, 
Um, we have two major universities, and one of our major universities has a speech pathology program, and they have a wonderful program for children that have conditions like this. You may have a psychologist that you may use. Um, now, let's talk about PDD. PDD is a term for pervasive developmental disorder which really brings in a collection of what we consider under the autism spectrum, like an altered response to the environment and impaired social interactions. Some of the ones that you want to think about that fall into this would be autism, Asperger's, Rett's, and childhood disintegrative disorder. Doesn't that sound horrendous? It sounds like they just disintegrate, right? But you guys know what I mean. These are skills. And then let's take a moment, looking in your notes, if you will look in your notes. Are you on page 52? Okay. Let's take a moment here and look at your notes. We would use as our resource is the DSM-4 um, uh, criteria, but autism spectrum is marked abnormal impaired social interaction. And you'll notice up there on this, uh, when we're looking at this, language delay and OCD are very common. So with an, a child with autism, where um, you, their environment is overwhelming to them, and they often focus in on one thing. For instance, I have a big box of toys. It's like a big basket. And I have some really cool toys that the kids can play with. And I even have this aircraft carrier that has all these little trucks and things that they can play. I have this little fella, all he likes, he has autism, all he likes are trains. I can have the coolest toy, other toy in there. He's not interested. He wants train. If there's a train in there, he perks up. So you see what I'm saying? It's very focused. That ties into OCD, obsessive compulsive. So you can see here where you're fixated on something, how that OCD can come through. Usually they have language disorders in terms of they don't, they're delayed in their language development. Asperger's, on the other side, is no language delay at all. As a matter of fact, many individuals who have Asperger's are extremely bright, highly accomplished, physicians, lawyers, scientists, and so forth. And uh, they're very good at what they do, but their other social abilities may be a little bit more limited. Now, there's RETS, and in your material, RETS, is highly specific in terms of a distinctive pattern of neurodegenerative findings and you'll see here, it's only in females. I'll tell you right now, RETS is the most severe, and it's the only one found in females. Clinical presentations lack gain of the, um, as you can see here, milestones, um, particularly looking at skills related to speech and hand, delayed head growth, seizures, scoliosis, and hypertonicity. Uh, we also know the childhood disintegrative really looks at this is a child who's been going along, developing well, and all of a sudden, after about two years of doing what you expected, they all of a sudden start to regress in multiple areas of their previous development. So when we think about this, we really don't know exactly what causes any of these conditions. We do find it under the neurological um, um, specialty, so that's who you would refer to, neurology. No clear ideology, and you could see here more common in males, but except for Rett's is the only one that's most severe in females. And we also know that the range can be quite varied. Um, in the DSM criteria, if you looked up any one of these, it would give you the areas of motor language and communication social, three categories. They're looking at behavioral changes. Now, language characteristics, as I already mentioned here for autism, I think we pretty much covered that. And then early screening and referral is very important. Um, when I worked for Children's Medical Services Department of Health, we used to run an autism program. Think about this. Some, you know, one of the highlights, one of the milestones for you as a parent is taking your kid to see Santa Claus, having your kid sit on that Santa Claus's lap and get the picture, right? Now, we know some kids, you know, fall out cry, carry on, you know, that's scary. But a child with autism, a person that looks that awesomely different in their environment can really, so we used to run a program where our therapist, somebody that they knew, would dress up like Santa Claus so they could kind of recognize them so the parents could have the opportunity to work with their child with a special Christmas party. But you can see how that can be really hard on families sometimes. Um, so that's pretty much our toddlers and preschoolers. And did you notice a lot of that had to do with what? Had to do with behavior. 
as to how they develop into behavior with their, their toileting, behavior with their learning, and so forth.